Hey everybody, Shelly here. Today you can follow along with me while I attempt another Bougaro master copy. This one's titled Young Girl Defending Herself Against Arrows. Let me know in the comments if you have ever uh, attempted a Bougaro master copy and were you successful. Bougaro is a master at painting flesh. His transitions are so subtle, yet he's able to capture the volume of his subjects so beautifully. His figures look as if they could step right out of the painting and just walk amongst us. <laughs> so let's see if I can even come close to his mastery. All right, here we go. First, I crop the image to just the head and put in my quarter grid marks. I'm going to be working on a 12 by 12 Centurion oil primed panel. I'm going to write the same size grid marks on my panel. I'm using an erasable colored pencil. I'm just going to check it against my monitor to make sure everything is exactly the same size. This is super important. And to be able to make sure it's the same size, you're going to zoom in or out of your picture on the monitor and make sure they match exactly. And that's a three inch grid by on a 12 by 12. And what that means is I have a 47% zoom on my monitor. I've downloaded my image from the Art Renewal Center's museum. This is the painting Bouro, Young Girl Defending Herself Against Arrows. The next thing we're gonna do is crop the image. So come over here to my crop tool. So I'm working on a 12 by 12 of just the young girl's head. So we're going to get that cropped into a perfect square. In fact, we can go up here to the ratio and hit square. So then all I have to do is decide where I want her and how big I want my square lines and hit the check mark and control zero will put it full screen. And there we have our cropped image 12 by 12 to match exactly our canvas. What I've done here is I've put in the grid lines and my grid lines are going to match up exactly to the grid lines that I've drawn on my 12 by 12 canvas. So we have a 12 by 12 canvas here on the screen and it's zoomed in to 47%, which I've determined is exactly the same grid size as what is on my canvas. That's important. If your grids don't match what's on your computer, then your figure face is <laughs> going to be distorted and we don't want that. Okay, so we've got everything lined up there and to turn off the grid lines, you hit control and semicolon at the same time and those will go off. You can hit it again to bring them back. Okay, so those go on and off. I'm painting in selective start. So I'm going to be working in full color right off the bat. However, I do like to analyze what's happening with the values just so I have a good idea of what I'm working with here. So the very next thing I do normally is I turn this image into a black and white image. So I've done that here. Now you can see a lot of the dark is up in her hair where it falls into the trees. And look at the front of her face here. You can see that's in um, pretty much shadow as well compared to the rest of her face, which is all very much um, darker than this background color here. So then the next thing I like to do is turn the black and white image into a four color noten, which is just going to really break down where the values fall. So I've done that here and that's what we get. So you can see there's a lot of dark area the face has a little bit of a mid value and then the only light value is in the background. There are no light values on this face. <laughs> I have to remember that. So that's what is so valuable from looking at the black and white image and then going into the note. And this has solidified in my mind that I am painting this head in the mid value to dark value that I'm going to set up on my palette only. Any highlight areas or light value areas are reserved for the background only. Let's analyze what we've got going on here for our flesh tones. So I've got a um, image with the palette to the side all ready to go. So I'll pull that up here. 
There we go. All right, unlock the image, make sure it's ready. We need our dropper tool, which is this little guy right here. So he is selected. And make sure your layer that you're working on, which is our image, is selected. Now I can start sampling what I want here. Now remember, we determined there are no light values in this face. So we could go ahead and sample this, which is giving me a light greenish color. And I'm gonna get a brush. I want a hard brush, so it gives us a nice brush stroke. I want my sample right around, uh, let's go a little bit bigger. Let's make the size 259, still a little bigger. There we go, 385. So light values I like to keep down here on the bottom. You can see just how light that is. Now it's lighter, light green in this area, but it looks like a little bit of a bluish color up here. So I'm gonna check that out and sure enough, so uh, control B, whoops, I thought, Okay, just the letter B will give me my brush. So you can see those two light values that we've got here that I'm gonna be using. So let's sample our flesh tones. So remember, we found that this part of the face, the front of the face, is going to be more shadow colors. So let's get our mid value. You know what I'm not getting? My circle, okay. So mid value. Hold on, something's off. What's happening? Oh, my opacity was too low. So let's go back and sample this area again. Put him there. Okay, and that's making more sense. This area again, and there. And these are light values? That's crazy. That doesn't look right. It is though, holy cow. That color, let's do half and half. Wow, it looks so dark on the white canvas. I would have never thought that was right. That's crazy. And look, we've got the same thing happening here. And wow. All right, so these are correct. <laughs> now, let's get back to sampling our mid value. There we go. Another one. There we go. This is a very dark portrait, really. It's crazy. So it looks like there's more light in the back of her neck and shoulder area. Now ears are always painted with these beautiful red colors. So let's see, that looks a little pink. No, gosh, everything's so dark. So much darker than what I'm expecting. That's a shadow color for sure. Look how dark this pink is and that lobe, ear lobes so dark <laughs> it doesn't register in my mind is that dark wow that's why it's always so interesting to do these color analysis I mean they're not foolproof but they get pretty darn close look at this warm almost a shadow color and then it hits a neutral color here as it moves towards the face, but it's not quite in shadow. Look at that. See how this one was warm and this one's neutral. So this is parallel to the light. Now we move perpendicular to the light moving into the shadow. And there we go. So this will be our shadow colors. And then we've got the eyebrow color the iris color check this out the white of the eye i'm thinking it's going to be 
a mid value, but I don't know, that's borderline shadow. I'm gonna leave it in the mids though. Look at this beautiful red eyelid color. Love that. Tip of her nose even. It gets a little bit lighter. There could be some light rolling around onto that part. And then it's a little darker and redder in this nostril area. Upper lip area. Look at this beautiful red line underneath the upper lip. And the nostril color. Look at the color of her teeth. Look how dark they are. That's got to be a shadow color. Yep. And this red bottom lip. Beautiful. A little bit of shadow underneath the bottom lip. Let's see. I'm guessing up here. I think that'll work. <laughs> and a little bit of the chin color. And it gets a little bit more volume right here and that area is going to be more in this neutral zone yep and look at this nice red line denoting the neck from the far shoulder beautiful well i think that's enough color analysis we can check some of the hair color let's look at the highlight area Oh, that's really dark. That's the highlight of the hair. Look how dark it is. <laughs> okay, so then let's sample a dark area of the hair. We'll put it right beside it. Wow, okay. That makes sense when you see them side by side. And there's some warm highlights here as well, but they're still pretty dark. Yep. And then, of course, we have these greens for the... I'll just put that there. A little bit of that tree line behind her. Okay, color analysis done. Let's go build our paint palette. The oil paints I'm using are titanium white, uh, yellow ochre pale, cad red light, carmine, uh, viridian green, and ultramarine blue. I felt like it'd be helpful to have a warm red, which is the cad red light, and a cool red, which is the carmine. I have the viridian green and the ultramarine blue on my palette as a way to knock down the saturation of my mixes when I'm using such strong reds. I want to be able to control that saturation. So you can see on the right side of the screen, these are all the colors that we found when we analyzed um, the Bouguereau painting. So I'm going to mix up some piles to capture the essence of uh, most of these dots. I'm not going to mix up a color to recreate every single dot that we found, but for the most part we'll be able to um, see the piles matching pretty closely a grouping of dots. Now I have my lightest lights on the very bottom, which is basically the background of the painting, which was kind of that blue green, uh, it's a, like a afternoon outdoor sky color. And then I put the greens just above that because I didn't really have any other room. And that was in the leaves that were near her hair. And then above that we have our mid value colors, which are pretty much beige taupe colors. I see a little bit of a warmer reddish towards the top of that grouping so we'll make sure we get that in. And then we move up into the top group of colors and those are my darks. Also from our analysis I see that my lighter mid, the mid value skin tones are going to be cool while the dark shadow colors are going to be warm. I chose to use the yellow ochre pale since the lighter mid-value flesh tones were more neutral. I feel like the uh, yellow ochre pale will get me there a little easier than if I had used the um, say cad yellow which is pretty intense and I feel like really gives you 
a lot of warmth. So this way I'm not fighting against that warm yellow. Okay, I am starting with the large shape of the hair. This is something I have not done before, so it's going to be sort of an experiment for me. I'm um, also, uh, for whatever reason, I haven't painted a lot of profiles. That was another reason why I chose this uh, Bouguereau Master Copy. I really wanted to practice painting a profile. So I figured when I looked at it initially, I just felt drawn to starting with that big shape of the hair, which also lets me set the darkest darks in the painting. And so here we go. Now, then after I had the hair laid down, I'm moving into that beautiful saturated ear. It's very uh, traditional of painters, especially from these eras, to put a lot of red in their ears. Now, the reason that is, in real life, the ear has a lot of blood in it and the skin is thin, so the blood comes to the surface more readily and since the skin is thin and the ear is a thin um, structure that sits away from the head a little bit, light can travel through it. So that's why it appears to have so much red in it. And I really love seeing that in uh, the Bouguereau painting and I'm going to try to capture it. So notice that I switched to a smaller brush for putting in the smaller structures, these little puzzle pieces that make up this gorgeous red ear. So these mid-value flesh colors appear to be kind of greenish. So I'm going to see if I can't balance that out with a little bit more red pulled into those areas. So you'll see I do some mixing on the palette, but also I'm doing some optical mixing right on the panel as I paint. And here I'm using this comber brush because it's going to allow me to interlock the brush marks as I lay down these flesh tones. It'll help me to mix them together. It'll help create really soft transitions and <laughs> I just love the effect of that uh, comber brush, especially when painting large areas of flesh. Now I'm doing some measuring with my proportion tool. Hey, if you don't have one and you've been looking for one, there is a link to the proportion tool in my description. It'll take you right to Amazon where you can grab one. Okay, notice that I'm putting down some flesh color and then I'm dragging a little bit of hair into the flesh color and then I'm dragging a little bit of flesh into the hair color because you do not want to have a harsh dividing line where the hair meets the flesh. So I like to work on the ear and then come away from it a little bit and get into some of that shoulder and neck area and then go back into the ear, maybe play with the hair a little bit and then go back to the ear because even though it's a small structure, there are a lot of tiny little puzzle pieces, if you will, that make this um, structure up. So remember, we're not painting things, we're painting each little puzzle piece. And with Selective Start, I'm trying to lay down the exact color in the correct value and put it in the correct spot and kind of make sure it's the correct shape. So <laughs> that's a lot uh, to think about with each brush stroke. So that's why the tiny brush and that's also why I keep going back into it. The other thing that makes this a bit of an experiment uh, it's pretty uh, understood that Bouguereau would put down an underpainting, let that dry, and then paint on top of it. Well, I'm experimenting with Selective Start when it comes to creating this master copy, which maybe it's more of a master study than really a master copy. So when you are painting a master copy, you want to get your painting to look exactly to every little tiny brushstroke transition, color change, everything is exactly the same. Now, even though it's a little cropped 
section of it, it's still, if you want it to be a true master copy, it has to look exactly like the goal, if you will, is to not be able to tell yours from the original when you're finished. So in the other thought process, a master study, you're really, you know, examining the painting of Bouguereau closely and you're maybe trying to learn how he created those flesh tones and you're, you know, practicing your mixing on the palette and the way that you lay the colors down on the canvas. And that's kind of what my thought process is um, turning to with this way of handling this master copy slash study because I'm doing it in selective start and I'm not putting down the underpainting. Now the last Bouguereau master copies that I've done, I've put down the underpainting first and I'll uh, go over how I felt about it at the end uh, when I see the final results. I'm thinking maybe putting down the uh, underpainting first may have helped me in getting those skin tones more correct initially. Now, as I'm putting them down on this panel, I'm going back and forth and I'm color correcting into that wet oil paint as I work. So you can um, see, I, and I'm sculpting a little bit as you will too with the color. So I'm using color temperature to help show volume, which Bouguereau did in his uh, painting as well. One of the things that I enjoyed about painting the profile is being able to carve out that profile using some of the background color. Um, I feel a lot like sculpting when I'm doing this kind of carving out and I enjoy that uh, in the process when I'm painting a portrait like this. So you'll see I went ahead and painted in the neck, the width of the neck, and then now I'm checking it because it's visually looking off to me a little bit, but I wanted to see how close I could get before actually like totally measuring it out. But I think with this portrait, uh, I, I probably should have taken my time and measured a little bit more. I feel like when I got up into the eye and the nose area that I wasn't measuring as often as perhaps I should have been. And I think the, um, the results ended up a little bit off, but you'll be the judge of that. <laughs> so take a look at my paint palette. You can see how the initial puddles of paint have kind of melded together a little bit and then other colors have been mixed in and they're, they've been altered a little bit. And that's just how it goes when I'm working and I have put down the initial colors. If you look at my palette to start before I'm painting and compare it to my final palette, uh, they usually uh, have a lot of new colors on them when I'm finished. And that's perfectly normal and okay. So remember the no tin, we have to paint the front of the face in a darker value. So I have to think about making sure I'm picking from those darker piles of paint and not moving into those mid value piles of paint. And when I'm doing the front of the face, the lips, the mouth, the nose, and into the eyes, it's <laughs> hard for my brain to wrap around the idea of painting that from my dark piles of paint. So I'm working a little bit lighter I feel like and darkening up once that I feel like the structure is sound and in a good spot. I didn't want to just jump right in there with heavy dark paint and then try to move that around if the structure wasn't in the right place. So that's my thought process on that but I have to remember to make it dark. I have a feeling that um, I may not make it as dark as I'm supposed to, but at the end we'll find out. I think also that 
putting the dark mass of hair down first is good in this sense because having that dark area to play against the darkness of the front of the face is going to make it a little less uh, intense for me. I think if I had started with that um, eye, nose, mouth, side of the face and knowing that I have to put it in really dark initially and that's the thing I'm starting with and it's on a white panel, I definitely would have painted it too light because when you put down those dark colors on that white panel with no other values to judge it by, oh my gosh, it would just look like crazy dark and you'd be like, oh no, that can't be right. Meanwhile, it could have even still been too light, but hopefully uh, having that dark hair mask down first will keep us on the right path. So I'm back into the ear and I'm definitely trying to make sure that that earlobe top part where the hair kind of butts up against it isn't painted with a harsh line. Now in Bougaro's, the line is very soft. The transitions are close in value and I'm just trying to get that transition there correct. So I keep coming back to it and working through some of the uh, transitions. And the other thing I'm reminding myself with these transitions is not to just blend two colors together and meet them in the middle. That just makes your painting look flat and muddy. If you can take paint color and step towards the other transition using different colors of paint, you're going to have a more successful painting in the end and better transitions. I highly doubt Bougaro just blended from a dark value towards a lighter value and blended the two together. I am pretty certain that he used color stepping, say, from a dark color towards a light color. And the steps of color in between were carefully thought out. So if you were in a warm shadow area stepping towards a light, as you're stepping, each color would get a little bit lighter, a little less warm. You'd finally get to a neutral color in the middle and then you'd be in your cool, lighter value colors as you get into the light side of that transition. I like to think of it as walking <laughs> and with each step, I'm putting down a different color footstep where eventually I will get to the final destination. <laughs> Okay, I'm starting to put in some of the eye and I wanted to get a little bit of that reddish flesh color down before I started putting um, the structure of the eye in. Now that's not something typically done with Selective Start, but in this case, I felt like I needed that base of flesh color to build my eye upon. Also having a little bit of flesh paint down if something's not in the correct spot, I can more easily move it than if I had just started painting the detail structure of the eye onto the white panel. So that's why I did it. Besides, remember what we say, you are the master of your painting. There are no rules when it comes to making your art. You're going to make it how you want to do it and you hopefully will get the results at the end that you are looking for. And that is what matters. I wish I had slowed down and done some more measuring here. I feel like this, um, I was probably getting a little bit tired. I think coming into like the fourth or fifth hour, I was really enjoying painting. Uh, just love the process of painting a portrait like this, but I should have slowed down and done a little bit more measuring to make sure that that eye and cheek and nose were really um, shaped correctly and put in the right spot. I mean, you see me doing a little bit of measuring here, but. Normally, I do a lot more measuring when it comes to putting in the eye. You 
may have noticed on my palette and in my painting how the flesh tones, especially those mid-value flesh tones, have warmed up and gone away from that greenish start that we had. I'm really paying attention to not have any harsh lines, especially in the eye area. So I'm putting down the structures of the eye and then a lot of times I'm painting a little bit over it or some of the surrounding colors into it and softening the line. So I may initially put it down a little bit harsh and then paint into it just to soften it up. The worst thing you can do to your portrait is put in the eye with harsh, heavy, dark lines. The, um, especially like the white of the eye moving in towards the iris or that the eyelashes on the upper lid can tend to be painted very harshly. Uh, if you just soften those and paint them with a lighter color even, uh, you'll find your portraits will start to have a little bit more of a realistic look to them when they're finished. So you may notice here uh, around that face area, my reds are looking a bit cool. Now in the actual painting, um, they don't look that cool to me, but seeing it here on the um, video, it definitely appears cool. So I went back and looked at it in the painting and there were a few areas where I just glazed over it a little bit with some CAD red light. But what I normally do on my palette is I like to start with the CAD red light and just pull a touch of the carmine, which is like cool red, similar to um, if you have a permanent Elysian crimson, if you have that on your palette, you can blend that with the CAD red and it, if like I have the CAD red light. So it's a tad bit orangey, I feel like. And I like to have this red to kind of balance that out. But I feel like when I'm looking at the actual painting in real life, it's not quite uh, showing as cool as what you see here. In next week's video, I'm going to put up on the screen Bouguereau's um, painting and put my master copy slash master study next to it. And we're going to talk about uh, whether or not I hit the mark <laughs> and really compare it, look at it in a black and white, look at it in color and pick it apart. I'm going to um, see how close or how far <laughs> the end results were. So look for that um, next Saturday. And basically I'm just continuing to noodle away <laughs> at the little transitions throughout the um, skin. The thing that uh, Bouguereau was such a master at was not really letting you even see or notice the transitions. They just appeared magically to be perfectly painted flesh. <laughs> and that does all come down to these uh, masterful transitions that he was so good at doing. And so I'm going to keep doing that, uh, work uh, the leaves into that background part of the hair so that I can finish up and get the full look of um, this young girl's head. The beautiful part of the dark hair against the leaves in that background area is that um, they're similar in value and it just doesn't let this harsh uh, hairline continue to be at the top of the painting so it blends beautifully in with the uh, background of those leaves. So you can uh, check it out next week and see the final, final finished results as how it compares to the actual Bouguereau painting. I appreciate you guys uh, watching. Uh, leave me some comments. Let me know if you want to see anything particular coming up in 2022. And I hope you guys have a happy new year.